called it a dog whistle. That's ridiculous. First off, affirmative action has done nothing to advance black economic interests. According to Stephen and Abigail Thernstrom of the Liberal Brookings Institute, quote, not only did significant advances predate the affirmative action era, the benefits of race-conscious politics are not clear. In the decades since affirmative action policies were first instituted, the poverty rate has remained basically unchanged. Despite black gains by numerous other measures, close to 30% of black families still live below the poverty line. In fact, very often those who make it into the top universities through affirmative action are themselves hurt by the process. Let's say a black student performed well enough to get into Duke, but not Yale. Putting that student at Yale means that instead of flourishing in an environment in which the student has earned membership, that student will now be the low man on the totem pole. In an article published in The Atlantic in 2012, Richard Sandard and Stuart Taylor Jr. highlight some of the ways this mismatch issue impacts black students. Mismatch students students who got in through significant affirmative action, they're twice as likely to be derailed from pursuing a doctorate and an academic career. Black law school grads are four times as likely to fail the bar as their white counterparts. Black college freshmen want to go into science or engineering more than white students, but are twice as likely to drop out. About half of black college students rank in the bottom 20% of their classes and the bottom 10% in law school. And of course, affirmative action is unfair to those of other races who outperform the minorities who benefit. A Princeton University study showed that blacks received a bonus of 230 points on SAT scores versus their competitors on the old 1600 point scale. By contrast, Asians were penalized 50 points. So this isn't a dog whistle. It's a solid policy aimed at ending the sort of discrimination that continues to divide us by race, assuming without evidence that a black kid who scores lower on the SATs than an Asian kid of the same socioeconomic status has somehow suffered more and requires the open university slot. That's pernicious, it's nasty, and it should be fought. Good for the Trump administration. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. All righty, so a lot to get to today. As always, I want to talk about uh, President Trump apparently opening the Seth Rich can of worms just a little bit. But the biggest story in the news is obviously what's going on in Venezuela, where socialism has collapsed, as it always does, into full-scale disaster. Going to talk about that in just a second. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Helix Sleep. So, as I mentioned before, I am world's crappiest sleeper. I am not good at sleeping. Uh, or at least I wasn't until we got the Helix Sleep mattress. So Helix Sleep is this fantastic service. Well, you go to their website over at helixsleep.com slash Ben, and you answer a few simple questions, and then they run your your answers through a customized algorithm to get you the sort of mattress that you need. And you can get a mattress that is different on both sides of the bed for you and your spouse. It's, they send it right to your door. Uh, you open up the box, you open up the plastic, and boom, the thing inflates right in front of you because it is a foam mattress. Uh, and it is supremely comfortable, and it is customized to you. Helix customers report a 30% improvement in overall sleep quality. Your mattress arrives at your door in about a week. Shipping is 100% free, and you have 100 nights to try it out. So if you don't like it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a 100% refund, no questions asked. So it really is a no-lose proposition. Plus, the mattresses like this are, are more inexpensive than mattresses of, uh, of comparable quality quality from other places. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben, get $50 off your order. That's helixsleep.com slash Ben, helixsleep.com slash Ben. A mattress is something you really should spend the money on. You're on it every single night, uh, and uh, your quality of sleep is going to make a difference in your life. It has for me. Helixsleep.com slash Ben to get $50 off your first order, and it lets them know that we sent you as well, so it helps out the show. Okay, so the latest from Venezuela is that there is total chaos. Total chaos is broken out uh, in Venezuela uh, in the last in the last three days, 10 people, opposition people have been killed. Opposition to the socialist dictator Nicolas Maduro, who was the guy who took over for Hugo Chavez. Uh, 10 people were killed on Sunday. There was a, a referendum or an election uh, for a constituent assembly. And this means in Venezuela that they want to replace basically the legislature with this new legislature run by the dictator. That's essentially why all the opposition boycotted. And, uh, and you can see how awful everything is in Venezuela here last night. Uh, Maduro went and had his police arrest the two main opposition leaders. Here's tape of that. This is clip 22. Oh. As a woman shouts as Venezuelan opposition leader Antonio Ledesma is taken from his home by force. He's shouting, this is a dictatorship, dictatorship. I am in my building. You don't need to close me out. They're taking Ledesma away. Let them know the neighbors of Santa Rosa. They're taking Ledesma away. Okay, so they took away Ledesma. They also took away named a guy named Leopoldo Lopez. These are both leaders of the democratic opposition to the socialist regime in Venezuela. Uh, on Sunday, there were riots in Venezuela in the middle of the election because the opposition was protesting, uh, and 10 people were killed. Here's some of the video from the riots. 
Election Day erupted again into violent clashes between anti-government protesters and the national police. The opposition did all it could to block roads to polling stations and otherwise disrupt the voting. They see President Nicolás Maduro's effort to rewrite the Constitution as yet another power grab. Nope, no paso. There are people who think this is a step towards dictatorship. What do you think? No, un paso no. No, not a step, said this man. We're in a dictatorship. The president went to vote early and called this the most important vote in the nation's history, a move to restore law and order, he said. And he thumbed his nose at international opposition to the vote. The U.S. is among those threatening further sanctions. Si tú no eliges... If you do not decide, who decides for you, he said, Donald Trump? If you, the Venezuelan people, do not decide, who will decide? In some pro-Maduro areas, voting was largely uneventful. But in the streets, over the past four months, more than 100 people have been killed, at least two today, in violent skirmishes. Okay, so the it's, important anti to note here, it's important to note here that Venezuela is one of the most natural resource-rich countries in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, they have enormous natural resources. Their oil reserves are the largest in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, they, are, they, they were an incredibly rich country. I mean, into, into the 90s, they were the richest country in South America. Hugo Chavez took over. He immediately began redistributionist programs, which I'll explain in a moment, and why this is important for the United States. And he immediately sank the country into absolute poverty. Here's some video from Venezuela's food lines. People have now been reduced to searching through garbage. Uh, I have a friend named Ami Horowitz who went down there, did a report from there. He watched his cameraman be shot to death. Caracas is the most, uh, is the most violent uh, city in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it, again, this was one of the wealthiest countries in the Western Hemisphere. It's just like Cuba. These were, these were wealthy, growing economies. Uh, and they've been absolutely destroyed by socialism. There, there are people now who are, who are searching through the trash. P when, when Ami was there, he told me that he was watching normal citizens hunting dogs to eat in the streets, like stray dogs, hunting them down, killing them, and eating them. Here is some video from CNN of some of the food lines. Again, this is the capital city of what was one of the great countries in the Western Hemisphere. Even in the driving rain, Venezuelans started their day in search of food, expecting to see the usual grim queues that form at government stores. Not today. The only stores with affordable food are shut. Closed for the National Workers' Holiday, the sign explains. It says sorry and thank you. People walked away empty-handed but full of dread, wondering where their next meal might come from. I asked Julian Perez what he needs. All the basics. I have nothing at home. Sometimes I go hungry. Who can say that we, the people, aren't hungry right now? And here's the thing. These people aren't allowed to come back tomorrow. Food is rationed here, doled out according to the last number on your government ID. Carlos Chirinos explains his turn is today. His number is five. Cinco. 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 This is insane. This is happening in a modern country. We can all see the tape of it, okay? And this is happening because of socialism. This is happening because of leftism. When Hugo Chavez took power, he took power saying that there were these rich oligarchs who were running the country. Now, the oil industry had already been nationalized in Venezuela, but what Hugo Chavez did is he grabbed up all of the foreign-owned drill, uh, all, the, all the drilling facilities and all of the sites. He grabbed all those up, he nationalized those, and then he used all the money supposedly to redistribute, but really it was to enshrine his own dictatorship. He paid off all of his supporters. He made sure that if you were not one of his supporters, you couldn't get a job. He ran people out of jobs. He set up these neighborhood councils that were theoretically supposed to redistribute property. He seized a thousand different plots of land all over the country for redistribution. They were never redistributed. Even when they were redistributed, it was very often to people who didn't know what they were doing. So what you ended up with was a dramatic drop-off in all of the productive capacity of the country, which prompted him to ratchet up tariffs, right? He said, okay, well, if we can't produce anything in the country and we're, getting, and we're buying everything from out of the country, we'll ratchet up the tariffs, which meant that no one could afford anything. So nothing was being imported and nothing was being produced. So nobody actually had either the money to buy anything or the productive capacity to make anything. He, he, he created wage controls. He created price controls. Uh, he ramped up the inflation. He entirely destroyed the economy. I mean, entirely destroyed it to the point where you're seeing people literally searching through the garbage at bread lines. I mean, not just at government bread lines. They'll go to bakeries. And this is according to the Associated Press. Hannah Dreyer of the Associated Press reporting today, quote, the government of President Nicolas Maduro blames the U.S. and right-wing business interests for the economic collapse, but most economists say it actually stems from the government-imposed price and currency distortions. 
Well, of course, the United States can't even trade with Venezuela because of Hugo Chavez and because of Nicolas Maduro. There often seems to be a direct line, she writes, between economic policy and daily hardship. One week, the administration declared that eggs would now be sold for no more than 30 cents a carton. The next week, eggs had disappeared from supermarkets and still have not come back. People started digging through the trash at all hours, pulling out vegetable peelings, soggy pizza crusts, eating them on the spot. That seemed like rock bottom until my local bakery started organizing lines each morning not to buy bread, but to eat trash. Okay, that's what's going on in Venezuela right now. And this is what happens when you have a government that is completely dedicated to the notion of eradicating income inequality. The reason I say that is that between 2000, well, Chavez took over in 1999, between 1999 and 2013 when Chavez died, the income inequality in Venezuela dropped dramatically. It's a crap hole. Okay, it was the second least income unequal country in the Western Hemisphere after Canada. Did it matter to these people who are starving on the streets? Of course not, because one way that you create income equality is by destroying the economy. Sudan has a lot of income equality. You know why? There's no one rich there, because it's a garbage country. Okay, it's run like garbage. So this is what happens in Venezuela. You have now more income equality. Unfortunately, everybody's poor and digging through the garbage. They, 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 in order to get out of this, they've now created hyperinflation. They're trying to inflate their way out. They've taken out loans and loans and loans and loans and trying to pay those back. They're inflating their currency now. In the last week, okay, you ready for this? On Friday, $1 equaled 10,389 bolivars. Bolivars are there, it's named after Simon Bolivar, uh, Simon Bolivar. Uh, it's, um, th that's their form of currency. 10,389 bolivars was $1. Er, on Monday, on Monday, you know, five days before, it was worth 8,820 bolivars. At the start of the year, $1 equaled 3,164 bolivars. Okay, so that means that they have increased inflation by 300% in the course of six months. Okay, that, that is why you're seeing people who can't buy anything. Your savings are worth nothing. You spent your entire life saving up, building up a business, putting that money in the bank, and now your savings are worth nothing. They are worth nothing. Okay, and for all the talk of, you know, they've, they've, they've absolutely eradicated poverty. They've not eradicated poverty. Look at this country. Does this look like a country that's eradicated poverty? And the fact is their hospitals don't have gloves, don't have soap, don't have doctors. 10,000 doctors have left the country. No one can make a living here. This is what happens when you have a country that is solely dedicated to the proposition of dictatorship, the demagogues. I mean, this is Bernie Sanders' land. Okay, this is, the, this is when you demagogue and you say, it's big business that's doing all of this. All we have to do is seize all the property from big businesses and redistribute it or regulate it so deeply that we ensure that we spread around all the wealth. Now, I think that we should not allow the left to get away with this because what the left did is for literally years, for literally years, they talked about how wonderful Chavez was, how wonderful Chavezism was, how great... Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro war? It's amazing. You know, we on the right are criticized very often for the war in Iraq. How many evil countries has the left declared were good before they actually turned evil? The left actually liked Nazi Germany until it turned out that Hitler was Hitler. The left liked Mussolini and turned out that Mussolini was Mussolini. The left liked Lenin until it turned out that Lenin and Stalin were Lenin and Stalin. The left liked Mao until it turned out that Mao was Mao. The left liked Hugo Chavez and turned out, until it turned out that Hugo Chavez was Hugo Chavez. And each time, each time leftist dictatorship is tried... Every single time, the left immediately declares after it fails, it wasn't honestly tried. Socialism's never been honestly tried. It's really funny. Today, I tweeted out that the World Bank calls Venezuela one of the most income equal states on earth. And the Socialist Party, the, offic the official Socialist Party, tweeted at me. And they said, how dare you blame socialism for this? Really? This is what they tweeted. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Venezuela is what happens when leftism goes wrong. Don't blame socialism for a leftist failure to manage a profit-driven capitalist economy. So in their opinion, if they just nationalized all the resources over at the Socialist Party, if they nationalized even more, it would go even better. And then they attached a graphic that said, question, which countries have tried socialism? Answer, with populations collectively and directly owning the means of production and distribution, therefore resulting in free access to all goods and services? None. Socialism has never yet existed. Socialism has existed, and the closer you get to a government-run economy, the worse things get. For all the talk about the socialist economies in, in Western Europe, they are not socialist economies. Okay, they really are not. They are capitalist economies with heavy taxation placed on top of them. Even the taxation levels on businesses are very low. The reason that Denmark continues, I mean, it was a thriving society. They created a massive welfare state on top of it that killed the economy, and now they're moving to the right and looking to slash taxes. The fact is you cannot tax and spend your way into prosperity. That's not the way business works. That's not the way po prosperity works. Now, before people say, well, the left never identified with Venezuela. I mean, the left never sided with Venezuela. Let's just go through the left's quick record on this. I mean, let's go through the left's record on Venezuela. So let's start with Michael Moore. Here's what Michael Moore tweeted. This is in 2012. 
2013, March 5th, 2013, about Hugo Chavez upon his death. Quote, Hugo Chavez declared the oil belonged to the people. He used the oil to eliminate poverty, to eliminate 75% of extreme poverty, provide free health and education for all. Really? Does that look like a place with no extreme poverty? How about the health care? You know, the place where they don't have gloves or soap? Yeah, Michael Moore. Yeah, that guy was seated at the 2004 Democratic National Convention next to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, by the way, has also praised Hugo Chavez. When Hugo Chavez died, Jimmy Carter had this to say. Let me find the direct quote. Jimmy Carter praised Chavez's, quote, commitment to improving the lives of his fellow countrymen, adding that he would be remembered for his bold assertion of autonomy and independence for Latin American governments and for his formidable communication skills and personal connections with supporters in his country and abroad. To whom he gave hope and empowerment. Eugene Robinson of the Washington Post called Chavez quick and popular. Larry King called him huggable. The AP called him a fighter. The Atlantic stated, quote, passionate and charismatic. Chavez slipped comfortably into the role of romantic Latin American revolutionary, championing the poor against an unfeeling local oligarchy and its imperial paymasters. Today, millions of Venezuelans will weep tears of genuine anguish at his passing. ABC News and Univision said he was revered by Venezuela's poor, who considered him one of their own. The New York Times sounded off, calling him a dreamer with a common touch and enormous ambition. All he had to do was crush his adversaries, destroy the economy, destroy press freedoms in the country. No problem at all. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist who leans to the left, he said this in 2007, quote, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez appears to have had success in bringing health and education to the people in the poor neighborhoods of Caracas, again, now the most violent city in the Western Hemisphere, to those who previously, previously saw few benefits of the country's oil wealth. It is not only important to have sustainable growth, but to ensure the best distribution of economic growth for the benefit of all citizens. Once you redistribute, you cannot, you cannot hope to grow. Okay, that's what redistributionism does. It destroys the incentive for profit creation. I want to talk more about what the left has had to say about this regime because they own this. The left owns Venezuela. Don't allow Bernie Sanders to escape responsibility for Venezuela. Bernie Sanders believes in the same principles as Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. He pretends he doesn't. He lies about it. The left lies about this routinely. When they say there's a leftist utopia, the leftist utopia looks a lot more like Venezuela than it does like Denmark because the bottom line is that even Denmark is based on a capitalist system that the left really doesn't like very much. They, they, by the way, even Denmark, if it didn't have the United States holding up its military budget for years and years and years, and if they hadn't been using capitalist corporate tax systems for years and years and years, uh, would have been in serious trouble, look a lot more like Greece than it would like Denmark. Uh, but before we get to any of that, first, I want to say thank you to our friends over at the USCCA. And the, over the weekend, the Chicago Trib reported that 56 people were wounded, 11 of them fatally. But these are dangerous times. One of the kids who was killed was 10-year-old Gustavo. He was simply riding in the car with his dad when he was attacked. Well, that's not the same thing for a lot of USCCA members. Uh, there was one USCCA member, David, whose young sons were threatened by armed thugs during a trip to the barbershop. He was forced to use his firearm to defend them. He killed one guy and he wounded the other, which is the way that you are supposed to do it if you own a gun. Um, but that didn't end your legal saga because the fact is that the USCCA then had to step in and help guide David through the aftermath. There will be legal consequences if you, are un if you have to use your firearm under any circumstances. USCCA was there to provide all of that. USCCA helps ensure you against what happens after you use your firearm, train you for using your firearm, get you the firearm. Visit DefendMyFamilyNow.com to hear all the shocking details on David's story and see the live news footage that captured the moment he was forced to shoot on tape. While you're there, you can figure out how you too can protect your family's future from the unthinkable. That's what DefendMyFamilyNow.com is for. DefendMyFamilyNow.com. Again, you want to know how to defend your family and you want to be insured for after you defend your family because the last thing you want is to spend three years of your life tied up in court with nobody to help you out. That's what the USCCA is for, and we thank them for their sponsorship, DefendMyFamilyNow.com. Okay, so here are just a few of the key figures on the left who have spent years praising Hugo Chavez. Here's Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labor Party in Great Britain, who nearly won election to the prime ministership of Great Britain, talking about Nicolas Maduro. Jeremy Corbyn, a deputado del Parliament de Britannico. He has come in on a amigo muy, muy bueno de Tony Benn. Ahora es muy triste. It's a very sad time since he passed away last week. He was a leader in the fight against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's the leader of the war against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Afghanistan. También, uh, and also a leader in the struggle against the policies of the European Bank. Contra, uh, la policía económica del uh, Banco Europa. And others which were detrimental to the poor of Britain and other countries. During his life, we discussed many times the problems for building socialism and the fight against capitalism. And as the leader of the Labour Party, 
Et là, le problème est de lutter contre, contre le capitalisme. Et durant le World War II, il y a eu un grand strike en 1945 <laughs> Well, I think if people have oil under their ground, they're called wacky. Yeah. Um, I found him a very uh, fascinating guy. Very, you know, he's done, for the moment, uh, in incredible things for uh, the 80% of the people that are very poor there. Um, but a fascinating character, somebody I'm writing about. And, uh, yeah. Just a genius, Sean Penn. Noam Chomsky, great thought leader of the left. He praised Hugo Chavez, of course. Had a significant role, but he also was significant in helping to bring about some form of unification of the hemisphere and move towards freeing themselves from imperial control, but he was not the only one. It's happened in most of the countries, and it's dramatic. Uh, the past uh, 10 years have seen a change of absolutely historic significance. Uh, this is the first government, everyone concedes, that uh, gave the population a sense that uh, of empowerment, that there's a government for them. In fact, if you look at the the there left polls, owns this. Please. It Don't gave get... them a sense of empowerment. This is what leftism looks like. The left owns Venezuela. And now, they're never gonna, they've never heard of it. What is this Venezuela country you're talking about? Never heard of Ugo, who? Nicholas, what? Okay, the, the left does this every time. Okay, when, when people say to the right, what do your ideal countries look like? What are your ideal economic systems? Very often, people like me will point to places like Singapore, right? We'll talk about places that have open trade, uh, places that, that have attempted to lower taxes, not necessarily every aspect of their culture is something that I want the United States to emulate, but economically free systems benefit. We don't like socialism and redistributionism because inevitably, once you take the line of redistributionism far enough, you end up destroying the economy. And if you continue down that line and you don't tack back to the center, you end up destroying it even more. Honest leftists will say that leftism is basically a, a dose against capitalism. And if you take it too far, it'll kill the patient, but maybe you need a little bit of it. But that's not, but the, the true honest leftists who really believe this stuff believe that what Chavez did was great. And then they're shocked when the dose killed the patient. I want to talk a little more about this, and then I want to get to some of the stuff happening inside the Trump administration in just a minute. For that, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com. $9.99 a month gets you a subscription to dailywire.com. That means you get the rest of this show live. It's a video show, so you get to see it. It means that you also get Andrew Clavin's show live. You get to see that as well. You also get to see the brand new Michael Knowles show, which has just started. Uh, I uh, watched yesterday's episode, and uh, it was as good as it can possibly be, Michael. But it's actually pretty good. It's pretty funny. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, the Michael Knowles show over at, at Daily Wire, $9.99 a month. Um, plus, you get the entire website ad-free. Plus, if you uh, get the annual subscription, then you get this magnificent, incomparable, spectacular, unparalleled Tumblr, leftist tears, hot or cold. It has our logo upon it. It's something you'll treasure all of your days. Uh, and when you die, you'll pass it on to your children who will treasure it all of theirs until one day it is found in a cave by Charlton Heston next to a screaming baby doll when the apes rule the world. But it will survive the apocalypse. You won't, but this will survive the apocalypse. And that will be your lasting mark on civilization is that you'll have had this mug. So in any case, make sure that you go over and get the annual subscription. Or if you just want to... If you just want to listen later, go over to iTunes or SoundCloud and, uh, and make sure that you subscribe. Leave us a review. We always appreciate it. We are the largest conservative podcast in the nation. All righty. So, uh, the, the, as I say, bottom line is that the left loves this guy. I mean, Dan, I, I don't want to do more actors because, you know, actors are stupid. But Jesse Jackson ran for president. He's still a prized character in the Democratic Party. Here's Jesse Jackson praising Hugo Chavez when he died. Hugo fed the hungry. Hugo alimentó al hambriento. He lifted the poor. Él luchó y enalteció a los humildes. He raised their hopes. He helped them realize their dreams. Les ayudó a cumplir sus sueños. And so today we do mourn. Por lo tanto, hoy, en, en el día en que lloramos, because we've lost a lot. Lo hacemos porque hemos perdido mucho. But we have a lot left. Pero todavía nos queda mucho. A stable government. Un gobierno estable. An orderly transition. 
una transición ordenada We pray the presence of our great nations. que nos va a permitir construir esta gran nación we'll meet soon. y que pronto Just and wonderful. find common ground. Just, by the way, uh, Barack Obama once called Will Chavez harmless. Harmless. Does that look harmless to you, what's happening in Venezuela right now? The left owns this. Don't let them forget it. And next time they say that a country is engaging in the sort of revolutionary experimentation on economics that is going to lead to widespread prosperity, understand that the end result, no matter how you approach it, the end result is when you tack to the left, when you tack too far to the left, you end up in Venezuela. Okay, so in other news, uh, more kind of silliness from the White House. So yesterday, uh, there was a report, there was a lawsuit that, that broke uh, in which a guy named Rod Wheeler, who was an investigator, he was investigating supposedly the death of Seth Rich, and he had a lawsuit suing a bunch of people, including Ed Butowski, who was a guy who funded him. And in his lawsuit, he alleged that basically Fox News and the White House cooperated in order to push the Seth Rich story. For those who don't remember, this is a conspiracy theory. Seth Rich was a DNC staffer. He was killed at four in the morning on a Washington, D.C. street. Uh, and there were accusations that he was killed having something to do with the fact that he, the idea, it's not a fact, the idea that he was uh, leaking information to WikiLeaks and maybe the Democrats didn't like it and killed him or some such nonsense. Uh, so Sarah Huckabee Sanders at the White House, and she's asked about this, she said, listen, we had nothing to do with the Seth Rich story, so this is all nonsense. Did the president know about the story pre-publication and did he have an influence on the way the story was written? The president had no knowledge of the story, and it's completely untrue that he or the White House involvement in the story. Uh, and beyond that, this is ongoing litigation, and I'd refer you to the actual parties involved, which aren't the White House. Okay, so good for her. Okay, that's good news. Then it's followed up with somebody asking, okay, so does Trump believe the Seth Rich conspiracy theory that the leaks, the, the Russian leaks were not actually Russian, they were Seth Rich talking to WikiLeaks? And here is Sarah Huckabee Sanders' answer. Uh, very quickly on Seth Rich. Does the president believe the predicate of that original Fox News reporting that Seth Rich was responsible for the release of DNC emails to WikiLeaks? I, I'm, I'm not sure, Peter. Thanks, guys. We've got a small business uh, event coming up shortly, and hopefully you'll all tune in. Okay, it's a pretty amazing statement there that she's not sure what Trump believes about the Seth Rich conspiracy. The reason that's amazing is not because she couldn't say that he doesn't believe it. Uh, you know, that, like, maybe she's never talked about it with him. But... This is the inherent problem with having Trump as your president and you being his press secretary. It, imagine, you could easily imagine a situation in which she went out there and she said, of course he doesn't believe it. That's, a, that's an unsubstantiated theory. And two minutes later, Trump gets on Twitter and he says, well, maybe it happened. A lot of people are saying it happened. People. Right? I mean, you could easily see him doing that because he's done that over and over and over again. Perfect example. Yesterday. You know, yesterday. Okay, so flashback. There's the Donald Trump Jr. meeting with a bunch of Russian lawyers, Russian-connected lawyers. He's been promised there's going to be some dirty Hillary information and that the Russian government will pledge their support basically to Donald Trump. He initiates this meeting. Jay Sekulow, this is a few days ago. This is just a couple of weeks ago. He's on with Chris Cuomo, and he has asked, so Donald Trump Jr., if you recall, released a statement initially about the meeting, and he said, we only discussed Russian adoption. We didn't discuss anything having to do with the campaign. And that ended up not being true. So the original statement... There were rumors that it had been drafted by Donald Trump himself, not by Trump Jr. And uh, Jay Sekulow was on TV a few weeks ago, and here's Jay Sekulow saying, no, Trump had nothing to do with this statement. Let's focus on what the president was aware of. Nothing. He was not aware of the meeting, did not attend the meeting, and was only uh, informed about the emails uh, very recently by his counsel. So and he didn't have anything to do with the statement that Don Jr. put out that was being worked on with his team? That's No, the, it was the statement that Don Jr. put out. Are you talking about yesterday's, Chris? Um, the one which, over the weekend which, that, yeah. that the president's no, that was team written, was that helping was, with. That was written, no, that was written by Donald Trump Jr. and, and I'm sure with, in consultation with his lawer. Because so the New York Times has reporting that the president okayed the statement. That's, well, they're incorrect. The New York Times is wrong. Yeah, I know. Is that shocking that sometimes I make a mistake? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be disparaging. I mean, no, the president's coming back from the wall. He issues a statement. That was statement which, um, I, and I don't, by the way, I, I wasn't involved in the statement drafting at all, uh, nor was the president. Okay, I'm so assuming that again was and again and again, he keeps saying the president was not involved in the statement. Yesterday at the White House, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, was Donald Trump in involved in the drafting of the Trump Jr. statement? The statement that Don Jr. issued is true. There's no inaccuracy in the statement. The president weighed in as any father would based on the limited information that he had. Uh, this is all discussion, frankly, of no consequence. God. There was no follow-up. Mm. It was okay, disclosed so. to the president. This is the problem. If you're Sarah Huckabee Sanders, you don't know on a day-to-day -day basis if you're going to be undercut. 
this has to stop from Trump. But it's not going to stop from Trump because this is who Trump is. Yesterday, Trump came out and there was a, a Boy Scout. Uh, you know, he, he spoke to the Boy Scouts and we played the, the audio of it last week uh, and the video of it last week. And it was pretty ridiculous. I mean, he went out there and basically did a campaign rally in front of a bunch of 15-year-olds. Uh, and it was really quite hilarious. Uh, and then he said, I was called by a leader of the Boy Scouts who said it was the greatest speech they'd ever heard. The Boy Scouts came out and they said, uh, no, we didn't. In fact, we sort of said that the speech was inappropriate when no one here called him. <laughs> so he, if, he's, if he's fibbing about the Boy Scouts, it makes it very difficult to be his, his press secretary. Again, this is not on Sarah Huckabee Sanders. It's just to point out that whoever is the president's representative is going to be in a bit of trouble because you can't, you can't say things that any other person would think were normal because Trump might undercut you. And that leads to a serious problem for the Trump administration itself. You could imagine a whole spate of questions day after day, the media going in there and asking, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, does the president believe that the moon is made of green cheese and that the wizard and that the wicked witch of the West surrounds it on her broom every evening? And Sarah Huckabee Sanders goes, no, of course the president doesn't believe that. And then the next day, Trump comes out and says, well, I don't know, maybe. Right? And, the, and the problem is that because she's cautious about this, she's going to have to say, I don't know the answer. And then the headline the media are going to run is, Trump doesn't know whether moon is made of cheese. That's what they're doing on the Seth Rich thing. This is why having an unpredictable president or really an unstable president when it comes to these sorts of issues is really not helpful in any way. And it's why I'm very skeptical. You know, we'll find out. But I'm very skeptical that, that putting General John Kelly in charge of his staff is going to help. Uh, Corey Lewandowski yesterday, uh, another one of Trump's fabled wonderful picks, uh, he was saying that Kelly is the chief of staff, but he's not going to be chief of the president. Corey, let's talk about General Kelly. What? Uh, you know, you know him. I know him just very, you know, uh, very much on the surface. I've never really spent any time with him. Uh, but by all accounts, he was a loyal implementer and enforcer of the Trump agenda over at the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know how it would get anyone really, frankly, much better at DHS. Uh, and now he's in the West Wing, someone with very little political experience or none, uh, now managing that uh, sometimes unmanageable place. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Look, I think the choice for Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, was a clear reflection of his desire to move in a different direction and to put a reset together. But what I think if, if you know, General Kelly, Secretary Kelly is going to be successful, which he's going to learn very quickly, and uh, it's a phrase that I have coined and I think people understand is you have to let Trump be Trump. And you're not going to change the president because for the last 40 years he's been an unbelievably successful business executive a television executive, author, uh, you know, real estate executive, and he doesn't want to change. And that's not what the American people voted for. They didn't vote to have Donald Trump change. They voted for him to be himself. And what I think General Kelly is going to bring is the discipline to the staff. He's the chief of staff. He's not the chief of the president. And if he is able to do his job, which I think he will, which will be limiting the backbiting and the infighting amongst the individuals who are serving inside the administration, uh, that is a very, very important thing. and put everybody on one agenda, which is the Trump agenda. Okay, so again, this is the big problem here, uh, and it, it does remain a, a large problem for the Trump administration. Trump's got to lock it down. It's about Trump. It's not about his staff. It's not about all the people who surround him. At a certain point, if you as a human being are realizing that everybody around you doesn't want to be around you, maybe it's not the people around you who are the problem. Maybe it's you. Uh, and the president needs to start thinking about that a little bit more uh, if he wants to have a successful administration. Okay, and by the way, I think he's done a couple of good things in the last couple of days. I mean, I started the show talking about his affirmative action policy. That's good stuff. He's doing the right thing on Venezuela. They released it, The Trump administration released a statement yesterday in which they condemned Maduro. And they said that the United States hold Maduro personally responsible for the health and safety of Mr. Lopez, Mr. Ledesma, and any other C's. That's, that's, that's good. I mean, he's doing some of the right things. That can continue so long as he contains his own id, uh, and that's imperative. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things I hate. So, things I like, um, all week long we've been paying tribute to the late, great Anthony Scaramucci, uh, the greatest of all characters in the Trump saga thus far. Now, today's comparison to Anthony Scaramucci comes courtesy of Kevin Williamson at National Review. He wrote a fantastic piece in which he talked about how a lot of people who are kind of Trump followers are fans of Alec Baldwin's speech from Glen Gary Glenn Ross, the famous Always Be Closing speech. He says there's like a bunch of people who think that this guy's the hero of the film when in reality he's a jerk, right? And that is Anthony Scaramucci. It's almost impossible not to see Alec Baldwin's performance here and think of Scaramucci, a uh, bloviating guy, you know, over the top, talking about how powerful he is. Because only one thing counts in this life. Get them to sign on the line which is dotted. You hear me? You. 
same facts. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. A, I, D, A. Attention, interest, decision, action. Attention. Do I have your attention? Interest. Are you interested? I know you are, because it's f or walk. You close or you hit the bricks. Decision. Have you made your decision for Christ? An action. A I D A. Get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you going to take it? Take it. Okay, so the, the, one of the great speeches in, uh, in film history. This isn't actually part of the original play, which I didn't know. It was written specifically for the movie. Uh, Alec Baldwin's only in the movie for this five-minute segment, basically. Um, but, uh, but the truth is that people who think that this kind of stuff is real life are wrong. Okay, there, There's a whole group of business people who think of themselves as this hard-charging guy who's really going to get things done because this is how business... Not really how business works. The way that, that successful business actually works uh, is by making deals that are mutually beneficial for the two sides, not by screwing people. The people who tend to screw people are the people who have great image, you know, like Trump and Scaramucci, but aren't necessarily the world's best business people because they're not actually providing a mutual benefit in, in, in their dealings. Okay, uh, other things that I like. I just had to show you this catch from MLB last night. Uh, this is Austin Jackson uh, playing for the Detroit Tigers. Uh, oh, actually, no, he's playing for sorry, the Cleveland Indians, I believe, against uh, the Boston Red Sox. And he's going to make one of the great catches you've ever seen in center field. This is just amazing. Off the bat of Hanley Ramirez. Great hitter, too. Andre, switch hitter at that. There's a long fly ball. Deep center field. Jackson's back. He leaps. He made an unbelievable catch. He flipped into the bullpen. Did he hang on? That's the only question at this point. He sure did. What a play by Austin oh. Jackson. <laughs> that just might be the play of the year. Hanley Ramirez is stunned. Did you see how high Lindor jumped after he saw him jump over the fence with the ball? Austin Jackson can still go get him with the best. This might be the best time play you'll ever see. I'm pretty amazing. And the thing I love about baseball is that the Boston Red Sox, I mean, it's happening in Fenway Park. The Boston Red Sox fan gave him a standing ovation, and then after they showed the, the, the play again on the, on the big screen, they gave him a second standing ovation, which is a pretty cool thing. Okay, time for a thing that I hate. So let's do it. So CNN ran what I think is the world's stupidest headline. This is two days ago. It has also resulted in my most retweeted tweet ever. Uh, so here is the headline. It's a picture of what is clearly a woman who has had hormone treatment with her husband, a gay man. Uh, yeah, try to keep up with me here. It says, transgender man assigned the female gender at birth gives birth to a healthy baby boy. There are a couple of problems with this headline. One, transgender man, that's a woman. That's a biological woman who gave birth to a boy, right? And then it says, gives birth to a healthy baby boy. How dare CNN assign a sex to the baby? How dare they? They say that, that this transgender mind was assigned the female gender at birth, you know, just arbitrarily, randomly, randomly. How dare they say that this was a baby boy? Maybe the boy doesn't want to be a boy. We don't know yet. Why don't they just say, gives birth to a baby? Why don't they say just gives birth to a being? We don't know if the baby even wants to identify as a human. They wants to identify as a cat. Do you know? I don't know. So I tweeted, uh, I t it, like, and this made the rounds. It's a big story. Ooh, big story. I tweeted out. Uh, after after this headline came out, I tweeted out, "Woman gives birth to baby boy." Right, that was my actually that was my tweet. That tweet now has, I believe, ninety six thousand likes. Ninety six. I mean, it's like a Trump tweet, like ninety six thousand likes, because that's obviously what this story is. Like, why is it a headline that a biological woman gave birth to a boy? Why is that a headline at all? It's only because this is a biological woman who's had some hormone treatments but hasn't had any of her parts changed. Obviously. Uh, I mean, it is a pretty amazing scam when you come to think about it. There's a gay man who's having sex with a woman who is apparently a man. So I guess this is a really weird way of getting gay men to marry women and have babies. You, but it's, it's – what? What? There are, there's other – I mean, I, I would also wonder – I tweeted out about this – that I wondered uh, what, this, uh, what this woman's perspective was on abortion until I realized she was a transgender man and therefore she can't speak about pregnancy because men can't get – it just doesn't work. None of it works, so – 
That's all, that's all confusing. Okay, well, normally I would spend some time deconstructing the culture, but we've come to the end of our time together today. So we'll have to come back here tomorrow. You'll have to come back to Mr. Shapiro's neighborhood. And when you come